The scripture reading this morning <clears throat> is taken from Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 34, and then 54 to 62. This can be found on page number 10 of your bulletin. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your journey may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. <clears throat> then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, and closely, looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him, but he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw them and said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and whipped bitterly. Well, good morning, and it's just wonderful to, uh, to be with you all. A couple of months ago, uh, the world came to learn about a very tragic incident, the implosion of the Titan submersible, this deep water, uh, deep water exploration vessel that five people were on board. It imploded, all of them lost their lives. And as it hit global news, we soon came to realize the riskiness of deep ocean exploration. And one of the reasons for that is that as you go deep into the ocean, the pressure begins to just build, the weight of water is just immense. And if, even if you go scuba diving, you could probably go to maybe 30, 40 meters down. But beyond that, the human body just can't take the pressure. And this morning, maybe you feel like your faith is undergoing the kind of deep ocean pressure. Maybe you're going through these circumstances that are really difficult, or maybe you're struggling with doubt, or maybe you're just trying so hard, but things seem to be getting harder and harder. As we continue this morning in our sermon series in the book of Luke that we're calling Looking to Jesus, the passage before us today shows uh, Peter, who's a disciple of Jesus and his faith is under serious pressure. This is the disciple who has, was the first to be called. He was very close to Jesus. He was the leader among the disciples. He was the disciple that Jesus said, I will build my church on. But as Jesus begins to go to the cross, he finds his faith under severe testing. And the big question we're looking to, to this passage to throw light on this morning is how do we remain faithful to God when our faith is tested? How do we remain faithful to God when our faith is tested? So please turn your Bibles with me to Luke 22, verses 31 to 62. And if you don't have a Bible with you, please feel free uh, to look to the bulletin for your text. you find it at page 10. Uh, let me pray before we begin. Father, this morning we just thank you that you desire to speak to us and I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts this morning uh, to just something new, something fresh. Uh, we want to encounter you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So as we look to this passage, we're going to be seeing three things. A promise broken, a promise kept, and a promise lived. A promise broken, a promise kept, and a promise lived. I'm not sure if you follow Indian cricket, 
But if you do, you'll recollect that in 2007, this was a T20 World Cup, Yuvraj Singh smashed six sixes, one after the other in one over against Stuart Broad. And for the less fortunate who don't follow cricket, uh, that's when a batsman hits the ball out of the stadium six times in a row. That's a feat really achieved maybe four or five times in, in a whole hundred years. But not many people know what went behind that particular smashing that Yuvraj did. It was that just before that happened in the previous over, a bowler went up to him and said, I'm going to rip your neck off, which was sporting banter to say, you're going to fail, you're going to be out. And what did that do to Yuvraj? That pumped him up to achieve a feat like that. But haven't you been there before? When someone says, you're not good enough, you're going to fail. And then what do you do? Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to prove it to you. I am good enough. You don't know anything about me. If you're in Delhi, maybe you'll say, you don't know anything about who my dad is. But either way, you're, you're ready to prove yourself. And really, when you look at the passage here in verses 31 and 32, here we have Peter being warned by Jesus that he's going to come under the attack of Satan and sin. Let's, let me read verse 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Although Jesus' warning ends with an encouragement that Peter, you'll rise, Peter doesn't seem to like this defeatist language. He doesn't like Satan's going to attack you, you're going to fall and turn again. And so he gives a fiery response. He's all fired up. Let's look at verse 33. Peter says to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. In one of the MI movies, Mission Impossible, let me not tell you which one, but you have the scene where this lady is invited to join Tom Cruise's inner circle. And she says, how can I trust you? So he looks at her and he says, I can't guarantee that you'll be safe, but I'll promise you one thing. Your life will matter more than my life. And that's what Peter is telling Jesus here. Your life, Jesus, will matter more than my life. It's MI kind of language. But if you look at the other gospel narratives, he says even more in his resolution, he says, everyone else may fall away, but not me. I won't deny you. And then he says, Lord, I will follow you even to the death. And Jesus' response is quite shocking. because Maybe the other disciples are all around, so it's in the hearing of everybody. This is what Jesus says. Look at verse 34. I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Jesus is saying, Peter, forget following me to death. In a few hours time, this very day, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but thrice. The conversation ends there for now. But you have to admit that Peter is just a resolute character. I mean, this guy has an indomitable will. Like, He's like Naam Chomsky's granddaddy. Okay? And I say that because Naam Chomsky wrote a book called Optimism Over Despair. Peter like, would write optimism over optimism. I mean, like you had the son of God who can tell the waves to keep quiet. He has prophesied a million other things. He knows what's in your heart and, his, and in your, your mind. And when he says, Peter, you're going to fall, uh, you just seem like you can prove him wrong. And it just gets Peter fired up all the more. He's even more resolute now. And how do we know that? Because you can see, as you read the rest of the gospel narratives and the passages in between, that he is on the top of his game. He's like, I'm going to prove myself, and I am going to stick it out now. So what does he do? He sticks close to Jesus. Okay? Uh, Jesus tells a figurative story about, uh, or a figurative wisdom he's giving them about take swords. What does Peter do? He goes and buys a sword. Gets a sword ready. Uh, Jesus goes to Mount of Olives. Peter's sticking with him. He's there at the Mount of Olives. Of course, he's sleeping, but he's still there. Uh, then after that, people come to arrest Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm the one. Take them. Peter, uh, unlike the other disciples, are all scared and flee. Peter takes his sword out. And he's ready to go to battle here. He's like, I'm ready to draw blood. He chops off someone's ear. 
and he's like you touch jesus i'm going to clobber you but then jesus gets seized by the jewish authorities and the jewish authorities come they take him away uh, and they're going to interrogate him to press charges and bring him to trial it's a little similar like how we have trials in our modern day and so peter uh, so jesus is taken away to the high priest house uh, and then this is where you jump to uh, the second part of this passage in verse 54 and you'll see that uh, in verse 54 then they seized him and led him away bringing him into the high priest house and peter was following at a distance do you see that who's still following it's peter everybody's left peter's peter hasn't he's still there and jesus' interrogation gets underway at the high priest house there's a little courtyard outside and in verse 55 we'll see that peter somehow manages to make it into the courtyard uh, and possibly from the high priest house where this interrogation is taking place when the doors are open maybe you could see some of it but you could definitely maybe hear things you're in the vicinity and there's a small crowd there it's cold it's a chilly night they light a fire and peter sits down and then let's look at verse 56 then a servant girl seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him said this man also was with him but he denied it saying woman i do not know him now peter may be thinking ah oh, i don't know if i can go to prison with jesus what about my family my parents my fishing business all those roman taxes to pay and suddenly his mind can't seem to remember the joy of jesus feeding 5000 people with two loaves of fish suddenly his ears can't seem to hear the raging storm whimper into silence at jesus's voice and suddenly he just can't seem to feel the hand that held him when he walked on water so what does he do he denies jesus i don't know him <sighs> okay peter you can gather yourself think about what you've done one more chance and a little later someone else saw him and said you also are one of them peter said man i am not this was a disciple who was with jesus in the mount of transfiguration when the divinity of christ shone elijah and moses the greatest prophets were worshiping jesus but suddenly now he can hear somebody slap jesus next door thud can i still trust him still want to be his disciples man i'm not and then verse 59 after an interval of about an hour still another insisted saying certainly this man was also with him for he too is a galilean so one more hour passes peter is still waiting he's hoping jesus would do something different armies heaven prophets it's all still going south now peter may be thinking of a painful roman execution ah the agony the torture of it the uncertainty the loss he's scared he knows he's seen jesus raise dead lazarus to life but when the man asked him in verse 58 are you with him what did he tell jesus i will be with you even to dead to death but when the man asked him are you with him peter says man i don't know what you're talking about and immediately while you're still speaking as jesus predicted the rooster crows but you and i may be very wired one way or the other okay we may be more optimistic we may be more pessimistic by nature but when it comes to our brokenness when it comes to the attack of evil and the sin in our own hearts we are far 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 more optimistic than reality we're just as optimistic as peter is if not more and one of the reasons for our optimism is that we remain deceived over the enemy's intent in 
This was a time when World War II hadn't broken out yet. Uh, Neville Chamberlain was the UK Prime Minister. And he had a decision to make because Hitler had just threatened more aggression in Europe. And he told Chamberlain, saying, if you want peace now, you've got to give me this tiny territory in Czechoslovakia. He alleged that there were a lot of Germans there, and so he said, give me this tiny territory, and then peace you will have. So Chamberlain's in quite a state of, obviously, a, a difficult decision to make lies ahead of him, and he says, okay, I'll enter into this peace treaty. And they don't go to war. They give this little portion of Czechoslovakia to Hitler, and look, uh, let me read from a transcript of what the British ambassador writes. We make a great mistake when our press persists in abusing him. Him means Hitler. Let it abuse his evil advisors, but give him a chance of being a good boy. If our object is to achieve results, that is the only line to take. If our only satisfaction is to slang him, then we must abandon hope of ever getting results. You know what happened when they gave Hitler a chance of being a good boy? He moved into Czechoslovakia. A few months later, he wiped out Czechoslovakia. He used that base as a military advantage. He moves into Poland, starts destroying country after country in Europe. World War II begins. I'm not a geopolitical expert, and I don't know if Chamberlain had decided differently whether that would have averted the war or not. But we do know this. He was completely mistaken about Hitler's intent. Of course, Chamberlain resigns and, you know, Churchill takes over. The rest is history. Millions die. Country is destroyed. War. Hitler was at the center. Because he had no intent of peace. He wanted to destroy. He wanted to take it all. You know what? In verse 31, Jesus is warning Peter but he's also warning you and me that sin and Satan are not here to take some of us, not to take a part of us, wants to take every bit of us, wants to take all of us. And this is what he says in verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Now, the Greek word for you here is plural. So when Satan demanded to have you, it actually means Satan demanded to have all of you. In fact, the NIV does say that Satan demanded to have all of you. So Satan's attack here was not just on Peter. He wanted to start with Peter maybe, but he knew Peter being a leader. He wanted Peter and John. Judas wasn't enough. He wanted all the disciples. He didn't want Jesus to go to the cross. He didn't want Jesus to build his church. He didn't want Jesus to build his kingdom. Because Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy. Just like in a war, when you join one side, when you come to Jesus, he's going to hate you all the more. And you know how he does that? He does it by deception. He wants to weaken our trust in Jesus. And there are really many forms of deception one can use, that the devil uses. And one of the forms of deception that you see the devil using in this passage is that he creates mistrust over God's word. He says, trust your feelings, trust your emotions over God's word. Isn't, what that, isn't that what Peter did over here? Peter thought he knew better than Jesus. And here's the thing, as Christians, we know that he's a defeated foe. But we sometimes forget that Satan's still a foe. But here's the bigger problem. We don't just underestimate the enemy's intent. We also underestimate the enemy's weapon. And the enemy's weapon is the sin in our own hearts. Here's how sin kills, kills us. It tells us that we're inherently good people and that to be worthy of God's love, we simply need to be at our best. That's what sin tells us. You're inherently good. To be worthy of love and to feel your righteousness, just be the best you can. Sometime in the 1940s, there was a gangster called Mickey Cohen. He was very famous in Los Angeles. He ran this whole criminal syndicate and he would, I mean, he got his cash from casinos, he'd murder people, 
and he was just known for a lot of criminal activity. And one day, uh, his criminal associate, Jim, comes to know Jesus. And somehow, you know, Mickey's not very happy about, happy about it at all. But Jim then invites Mickey to go to a Billy Graham crusade. So Mickey's at a Billy Graham crusade, the master criminal. And he hears about Jesus, and he says, yeah, I want to follow Jesus, and I'm going to give my life to him. And then Jim doesn't see him for some time. And after a few weeks, Jim realizes that Mickey's still leading all these gangs and doing all this criminal activity. And then Jim calls him up and says, Mickey, what's wrong with you? I thought you were following Jesus. He said, yeah, you have a Christian businessman and you have a Christian journalist and you have a Christian plumber. Why can't you be a Christian gangster? I'm just being a Christian gangster. And then Jim says, Mickey, it doesn't work that way. you got to leave this. And he says, oops, I don't think I can do that. But here's the thing. We sometimes think, this is what sin does to us, that to be in God's love, we need to present a Christianized version of ourselves. That we need a better self. Wasn't that what Peter's trying to do here? He's trying to show himself worthy of God's love and being Jesus' disciple by what he's able to give to Jesus. Yeah, he's able to die for him and go to prison for him. But here's the sad truth. Our sin actually thrives when we're at our best. Because our best self is incapable of loving Jesus the most. Let me say that again. Our best self is incapable of loving Jesus the most. And when testing times come to your faith, it will expose what you love the most. And the question is, when testing times come and your faith is exposed, what does your heart love the most? Because your heart is going to give itself to whatever it deeply loves. When Peter's was, faith was tested, he clung to his own abilities, he clung to his own best self, instead of turning to Jesus for strength. Whether you follow Jesus or not, testing times will come. But particularly if you follow Jesus, testing times will come. What or whom do you turn to in your testing time? When you're feeling really low, what gives you comfort? Who are you turning to? Peter didn't love Jesus the most, and it was a promise broken. But let's go further in this passage because we see a promise kept. Now, Peter denies Jesus three times. So we see that around verse 59. And then let's look at what happens next in verse 60. Uh, sorry, verse 60, the first far, part is where he denies Jesus. And then the second part, just soon, it happens almost simultaneously. It says, and immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter didn't just weep. He wept bitterly. He's in a place of deep shame and guilt because he's denied Jesus publicly, emphatically, and repeatedly. Haven't all of us been in that place of deep guilt, deep shame? This again is Satan and sin's point of attack. Imagine for a moment that you're in a boxing ring. And imagine one boxer gives a hammering blow to the other box. And it's on the ground, maybe some blood here and there. But as he writes in pain, imagine if his opponent goes back to keep punching him so he doesn't get up. That's what sin and Satan do to us. It lures us into temptation. It brings pride so we fall. And then as soon as we fall, it says, Aha! There you go. You're guilty. And all the feelings of guilt bring self-hate, regret, shame, condemnation, make us feel dirty inside. You just want to... The, the, the one thing you want to do is just run from God. Because the pain is so much. Some people carry so much pain, they just 
think about taking their lives right there. But the thing we need to say about guilt is that there's a difference between feeling guilty and being guilty. Imagine a courtroom trial where someone's accused of murder. They come up before the judge and the judge says, yes, present your case. So maybe the accused person or his counsel says, look, he's killed someone, he's murdered someone. And so the judge says, ah, he's guilty. He says, no, 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 he's innocent. What do you mean he's innocent? He killed the victim because the victim was just so annoying. And you know what, judge? He was so annoying, you would have killed him too. I mean, see, we laugh at rationalization, don't we? Now, rationalization can speak to your feelings of guilt, but it didn't matter whether this guy was rationalizing and saying, I don't feel guilty about killing this guy. His guilt was a reality. Now imagine another scene, courtroom scene again, where you have a person accused of murder and the judge says, now what is it? Another person comes up and says, I'm guilty of murder, but I think you should declare me innocent and let me go. So the judge says, what? Why? Because I've resolved solemnly that I won't do it again. Is the judge going to let someone go when he's committed murder because he says that he's resolute and he's not going to do it again? That doesn't take away his guilt. You know, we can sometimes, we can maybe make light of an example like that about rationalization and resolution. But that's what we do with us in all the time. Every one of us does that. You may be a Christian and you're thinking to yourself, I know as a Christian, sex before marriage is not God's design for me. But it's just the culture today. And I was just feeling so low. And how else do you test sexual compatibility with your future partner? See, we can rationalize. Or maybe you're a parent and you just screamed at your kid. You turned into a monster over your child. You're feeling bad. You say, ah, that was horrible. But I'll be patient next time. See, that's resolution. But here's the thing. If we're all really honest about it, we know there are sins that we've resolved not to do, but we do them over and over and over and over and over again. Resolution's not working. And there are sins that we have no rational for. What do you mean? Haven't we all said things like, oh, I can't believe I just did that. Oh, I can't believe I just said that. You know what we're saying to ourselves in that moment? There's no rational reason for why I did that. That's why Paul says, the evil that's in me in Romans 18, it's, I keep doing that over and over and over again. There's no rational for why I do the evil I don't want to do. Peter here in this passage realizes, or at least if you've seen what he's done, resolution hasn't worked. I told you, this was Peter at his best. He got the swords out. He was with Jesus in the Mount of Olives. He followed him. He went with him. He told him that he'd die for him. Resolution failed. Rationalization? Well, someone, they hadn't told him he was going to die. They just asked him he was going to be with Jesus. I mean, he saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the grave. He heard Jesus say, I will rise. Is there a rational there? So feeling guilty and broken, he's weeping. But... Let's look at the trigger to what Peter's weeping is, because in 61, we see that Jesus looks at him and it says that Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. I'm reading from verse 61. So Jesus looks at him and he remembers the saying, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. But that's not everything as to what Jesus said to him. Let's Backtrack a little bit, go back up to 31 and 32. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. And then let's read verse 32, because we'll see, although it was a warning, we'll find a promise in verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. 
Jesus prays that Peter's faith will not fail, and he promises it won't. Why? Because Jesus doesn't say, I hope you turn, maybe you'll turn, if you turn. But look at the, the language he uses. When you turn again, verse 32, right? When you turn again, indicating that his faith may falter, but it will not fail, it's going to hold strong. It's interesting, right? That Jesus, rather than praying that Satan won't attack Peter, that Peter won't fall, that this time of testing be taken away, what does he pray? That his faith would drive him to turn again. His utmost desire for Peter, even when Peter was tested, was for him to believe, to repent, and to believe in the redemption of God. To repent and believe in the redemption of God. And in this, you will see that Jesus offers a third way to deal with our guilt. It's not rationalization, it's not resolution. It's God's redemption through repentance and faith. And you say, well, what does that have to do with our guilt? Here's the thing, God's redemption is the only cure for our sin. And sin is what lies at the reality of our guilt. Okay. It's, far, it's far, far, far deeper than just feeling guilty. Jesus' redemption, Jesus' righteousness is able to actually deal with the sin that strikes at the reality of our guilt, that strikes at our being guilty. Imagine if there was no water in this world. But it scares me that we're really going to have a thirst problem. But something else that scares me equally is that what are we going to use to clean dirt with? Can't wash your hands, can't clean the house, can't clean a wound, right? Because only water can wash dirt. Only water has that cleaning substance in it. And likewise, there is nothing in the universe that can cure sin, nothing in the universe that can cure guilt, but the righteousness of Jesus. And when the righteousness of Jesus cures, it's gone, it's over. Doesn't matter whether you feel guilty or not, you're not guilty. And that's why John writes in 1 John 1 9, right? You confess your sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse you of some of your righteousness. No, cleanse you of all your righteousness. And Jesus was praying for Peter. Even as he felt guilty, should I even be a disciple anymore? Even as Satan said, You traitor, you despicable man. You have no right to be Jesus' disciple. Jesus was praying that Peter would see that Jesus was still in mercy towards him. Because you know what? When it comes to guilt, you know what, you know what I, my heart really, really wants? You know what your heart really, really wants is that when you do something guilty, you want to go back and undo the past, right? That's why guilt makes you feel so powerless. Because no amount of rationalization and resolution can make you go back and undo your past. But listen to this. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus undoes our past. He actually lived the life we should have lived. Where Peter was unfaithful, Jesus was actually faithful. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and where Peter says, I'm going to face death on my own strength. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane when the, when the torment of death and the sin of the world was upon him. He goes and prays for strength from the Father. When Peter denied God, what did Jesus say? Father, not my will, but your will be done. Do you see it? Peter wasn't faithful, but Jesus was faithful in the way he should have been. And so he can go back and undo our past. Because Jesus has lived the life we've lived. It doesn't matter if you're single or you're married. Everything that we've done, Jesus' redemption offered to us is to undo our past. But that's just not it. Jesus can redeem our future. You see... When Peter deserved punishment, he rejected God. So he deserved to be forsaken. He couldn't love 
Jesus the most, but what does Jesus do? For that Peter, he is forsaken by Christ, by God, so that Peter can live again. He dies so that Peter lives. And he has died so that we can live. Peter ran in his own boastful strength. Jesus conquered. And here's what we ought to see is that at that point, at that exact point, when Peter comes to say, I don't love you enough to die for you. Guess who walks by? Jesus says, Peter, in this moment, I love you enough, I'm going to die for you. And that just begins to do something to Peter's heart, which brings us to look at a promise lived. You know, Peter had followed Jesus for three years, right? So he knew it was tough. I mean, it's, he was not under any illusion. He had left his home, left his you know, family. It's, it was not easy traveling all around, and uh, he'd given up a lot to follow Jesus. But he underestimated one thing. He just didn't realize how hard it would be to follow Jesus. He knew it was hard, but he hadn't realized that in his own strength, it would be impossible to follow Jesus. He thought it was hard, but he thought it was hard enough where Peter's best self could still follow Jesus. Until he realized, my best self cannot follow Jesus. It's impossible. But there's something else also that Peter grossly underestimates. He underestimates how much Jesus loved him. He knew Jesus loved him. He just didn't know how much Jesus loved him. You know, after Peter denies Jesus a third time and the rooster crows, we read in verse 62. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. I want you to imagine this moment. He's just denied Jesus, remember, and just before he denies Jesus. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Okay, this is just before he weeps, just after he's denied Jesus. What a beautiful, almost like a haunting picture of hope, right? That in that moment where Peter's completely fallen and denied Jesus three times, Jesus turns and looks at him. You know, as a parent, when I'm going through smaller stresses, it's really hard to pay attention to my children. But when Jesus, he's got a torturous death awaiting him, the weight of the world's sin, he can turn and look with love on a treacherous disciple who has denied him humiliatingly and publicly. Now that's a picture of how even when Peter had turned away as a traitor, Jesus was saying, Peter, turn back because I'm always turned towards you faithfully in mercy. You know what Peter began to realize? That, hey, I'm not a disciple because I can follow him and die for him and go to prison and what I've left and all of that. I'm a disciple because he's chosen me in love, in grace and mercy. And Jesus loves me because he loves me. Jesus loves me because he is faithful to me. And when I see the faithfulness of Jesus to me and his love for me, I realize that the power to follow Jesus does not come from me. It comes from him. That we can do nothing in our own self. Jesus doesn't give us a better self. He gives us a new self. And this is what Peter began to see. That Jesus is sufficient for all of life. Our physical needs, our spiritual needs, our emotional needs, our comfort, our eternity, our past, our present, our future. He's everything we have. And that's why Peter writes in 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. 
You know, the greatest evidence of God's love in our heart, of his faithfulness, is that it changes you. And that's why you see, you see here where Jesus says, Peter, I pray that your faith will not fail. Your faith in my faithfulness and you will turn again. You will change. Peter realized that in his old self, in his best self, he couldn't love Jesus the most. And when testing times came, his faith faltered. But it didn't fail because as he saw this faithfulness of Jesus to him, even when he had been so unfaithful to Jesus, it made him love Jesus the most. That's what happens to Peter's heart. But he's unable to love Jesus the most, all his own strength. And he believes in the redemption of God, in the love of God, when he sees how much he needed to fall, see how much Jesus loved him, because we don't get it. How much ever sometimes God tries to show us, we just don't get how much. And Peter, the disciple of disciples, the person who founded the church, needed to fall so that he could see how much Jesus loved him. And you know what? His heart does change because in John chapter 21, verse 15, that's the gospel of John. Turn there, you'll see Jesus actually does ask him, Peter, do you love me the most? Do you love me more than these? And Peter says, I love you. And Jesus, making sure that every feeling of his being guilty is being hammered. So Jesus says again, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Yes, Lord, I do love you. And Jesus asked a third time, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, he's a little hurt at this point, but he says, Lord, you know that I love you. You know what? He's living in that moment knowing that he's free from the reality of guilt. It doesn't matter if the other disciples still think he's unworthy. It doesn't matter if he feels, the Lord knows. Our guilt is before God. Peter got it. And so he said, I don't need to prove my love for you. You know that I love you. Here's the thing, church. Following Jesus is costly. Because when Jesus asks us to follow him, he is calling us to love him the most. He is calling us to give up everything for him. To be willing to go to prison for him, to be willing to die for him, that didn't change. And when Peter said, Lord, I'm willing to go to prison and die for you, Jesus hardly doesn't say, no, he says, not yet, not ready now. But then when his heart changes, you know what? Peter goes to prison maybe many times. As the gospel is being spread and as he's founding the church, he's able to strengthen his brothers with his faith. And when he goes to prison, he's not scared. He's able to sing and dance. People tell him to shut up and stop talking in the temple about Jesus. He says, I can't keep quiet. And you know what? When Peter goes to die, historians tell us that he says, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus. So hang me upside down. That's what God's love does for us. It wasn't just Peter who went boldly to die for Jesus. Many, many have gone to die for Jesus after that. This Bible that I'm holding here, the English Bible, only found out more recently I, I knew that a man called William Tyndale was instrumental in translating the Bible into English. It was in Greek. It was in many other languages. And little did I know that there was another man called John Rogers who helped Tyndale and kind of took on even after Tyndale passed away. Now, at that particular point of time, the Catholic Church began to teach that, look, we don't want everyone to have access to the Bible. And your salvation doesn't depend on Jesus' work for you. It depends on what you do. And John Rogers, who knew the Bible, this, this love of God, he couldn't keep it. And so he began to translate the Bible so that everybody could read it. And as someone who 
work to the church. He said, no, the real truth of God that stands the test of time and is freeing and has changed his own heart to love Jesus the most is that our redemption is a gift of God. And so they threw him in prison because they said, this is heresy. You can't be saying such stuff. You can't be translating the, the Bible. In prison, he says, well, at least give me access so I can keep translating. He's kept in prison, away from his family, but he doesn't recant. So they tell him, we're going to burn you at the stake now. Now you'll recant. And, you know, this was a time in which Christians weren't really being slaughtered in big numbers. And so they said, well, he's definitely going to recant. And so they say, well, you're going to have to burn at the stake. So they said, are you willing to recant? No. So he walks out and they say, let's make it as humiliating as possible. 7,000 people, we told, gathered around and he's walking down a path. He sees his wife and children there. He keeps walking. He goes to the stake and they give him one last chance to recant. He doesn't. In peace and calm, he refuses and he's burnt at the stake. How could he forsake the God who never forsook him? But here's what's astounding. The French ambassador Noels witnessed what happened. And here's what he wrote. Rogers went to death. It was as if he was walking with such joy. It was as if he was walking to his wedding. For Rogers, living for Jesus was great. But he, he was to die so as to live with him forever in glory that was infinitely better. Because when we believe in the promise of God's faithfulness to us, it compels our faithfulness to Christ in the middle of trials. We're seeing so much go on around us. We don't know how the world is going to go. We can't promise that India is going to be an easy place for Christians in the future. But we do know this, that Jesus is faithful to us. And how can we be faithful when our faith gets tested? By believing in his faithfulness to us. So this morning, no matter how discouraged you may feel in your faith, take heart. Because when Jesus told Peter, saying, I'm praying that your faith won't fail, he is still interceding for us. Except now, Jesus is interceding, seated at the right hand of God, above every throne, above every power, praying that your faith and my faith will not fail. As David Mathis puts it, I don't think we're to picture Christ in heaven as our intercessor. On his knees, begging the Father, please don't destroy them. I'm asking for that one. No. He ever lives to make intercession for his people. How does he do it? He lives. If we are his and he is alive, then his very life, his very breath, the very beating of his glorified human heart that will never stop beating, intercedes for all those joined to him by faith. Satan may demand to have us but he is a conquered foe because Jesus has prayed that our faith will not fail. Take hope this morning. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, he's inviting you. Sin and Satan may attack. Jesus redeems, Jesus keeps, Jesus finishes, and Jesus never fails because Jesus lives. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we just thank you because we just don't know how much we are loved. We may not know, Lord, how sinful we are. We repent. But Lord, show us how loving you are. There's no way we'll be able to love you and obey you unless you show us how loving you are. Change our hearts, Lord. Breathe your life into us. Breathe your love into our hearts. Help us to know that we can remain faithful even when our faith is tested because you are faithful. 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen.